Hello there, everyone. People who are joining right now, this is Peter Tabbins. I'm MPP for Toronto Danforth. To all those who are just joining now, we've got more than 100 people registered. Again, I'm Peter Tabbins. I'm MPP for Toronto Danforth. I'm very pleased that you're able to join uh, myself and my colleagues, my panelists this evening. I think we're going to have a very good discussion. I want to welcome everyone to our meeting tonight, Child Care and the Pandemic. Uh, I'm going to start off by reading our land acknowledgement, and then I'll go to introduction of guests and setting out the agenda. Uh, we acknowledge we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas, of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. So welcome, everyone. This uh, get-together tonight is primarily to discuss the situation we face for parents and for centers in this pandemic. Uh, we started planning this event a few weeks ago when the vaccination of people in the education system was announced, but not the vaccination of childcare workers. This is a huge problem. Uh, childcare teachers and workers are vital to making sure that families can get on with their lives, can work. And there was an awful lot of public pressure that came out to change that, to give a priority to those working on our child care centers. That was successful, but it was also very clear that there were many other important issues that we're going to have to attend to if we're going to have centers that are open, uh, that are available, that are safe. And tonight, uh, we've assembled a panel to look at the steps we're going to have to take to protect our children, our child care workers, and our child care centers as the pandemic continues. And this is in light of the situation where we're seeing outbreaks in our centers and transmission of COVID to workers and to parents uh, from the children who are in centers. Uh, we've also heard reports of centers closing for good when what we need is a lot more childcare. I think we all agree on that. And we also recognize how critical it is for everyone to have the center safe and open. I wanna note that this evening, we will be taking questions and comments from the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you'll enter your questions or your comments uh, after our panelists have spoken, I'll be reading out some of your comments and putting your questions to the panelists. So I'll be introducing the panelists, very simple agenda. Panelists will speak for about five minutes each. We'll have questions and commentary by you to the panelists. And at about 8.25, we'll have closing comments and wrap up. So the three panelists we have this evening, uh, first, I'll start with Akua Asabia Blair. She's the CEO of the Massey Center on Broadview. Massey Center is a client-centered infant and early childhood mental health organization, which supports pregnant and parenting adolescents aged 13 to 25. We have Dr. Kate Dupuy, a parent and resident in Toronto Danforth. Dr. Dupuy is a clinical neuropsychologist who follows childcare issues closely and can speak for the experience that parents are going through with childcare today in our community. And we also have Carolyn Ferns, Public Policy and Government Relations Coordinator for the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care. Carolyn worked for over 10 years at the Child Care Resource and Research Unit, I believe at OISE, where she co-authored the Early Childhood Education and Care in Canada series. So welcome panelists, welcome all the participants out there. Uh, we're going to start off with you, Akua. Uh, the floor is yours. If you could talk about the situation as you see it and the challenges that you're encountering. Thank you, Peter, and uh, good evening, everyone. I am uh, Peter. I'm really pleased to be here because I, I've been so busy that I haven't found community to talk about some of the issues that that we're facing. I think uh, in the middle of the pandemic, we expanded our childcare and uh, our organization embarked on an, an amalgamation. So I've been very busy while trying to to um, manage the organization. And I'm so glad today that I have a chance to talk about what has been happening in um, the childcare that we operate. So I've, I've been at Massey now for you know almost 14 years. And uh, I've also, so we run a childcare center, but I've also been a parent who used the system. And uh, I must say that, uh, you know, in addition to the, the, the vulnerable populations that we've identified how they've been negatively impacted by COVID-19, 
we're also learning about the vulnerability of different systems and uh, childcare has been, <laughs> it, it's, it's showing up all the sores mm -hmm. and all the things that are not working well in what it was supposed to be a system. Um, first of all, you know, uh, you know, one would expect that the system would have had a plan for a pandemic. You know, um, you know, our organization goes through accreditation um, every four years, and one of the things that we get um, that we get asked is, you know, what's your pandemic plan? And I thought the system, and I felt that the system hasn't supported and worked well for the best interests of uh, those of us that are operating the programs. Not only are we trying to make decisions without information, and you know, funders are always telling us you you know, you want to make best decisions and evidence-based decisions. And yet we were operating from day one in a vacuum of information, trying to figure out what we needed to do, not, you know, with our, with the, with our staff and with the programs that we're supposed to operate. So there's been a huge vacuum, a, a, a big communication gap in terms of funders and operators. You know, what were you supposed to do? I remember the the Friday afternoon when we heard that our center was closing, I was sitting in my office thinking, yeah, and there's some communication are gonna come from our funder about what to do. And I kept waiting and I kept searching and I'm thinking something is coming, nothing came. And that has been sort of the symptomatic of what has gone on with the system. You know, we're worried about um, protecting our staff who are um, single moms themselves, who are now also facing the challenge of schooling their kids while they have to work. So we, the system is so stressed. <laughs> there isn't enough people to do the work that we're supposed to do. You know, when we closed our, our, our program in March of last year, we were, you know, we're a hundred percent. When we opened, we we're less than 40%. But we, in order to operate, you needed to have more staff, the same if not more staff to do the work that you, you needed to do. And there was no answers, but we had to just do what we think that was right. But with the stress of not knowing whether or not the organization was gonna be able to meet the financial burden that it was taking on. So we did a lot of work and parents, are reluctant. Um, you know, we tried to do a lot of convincing with parents around, you know, what our policies and protocols were going to be, but it was very hard for parents and parents are waiting. They're on wait lists, but are not quite ready to commit. And so we have struggled over the last few years, the last few years, the last year to try and keep up with our attendance and to keep up with all the various protocols that were supposed to be in place. You know, we met, we're a multi-service. So I saw when a program funded program, how our funders told us, don't worry, we're gonna give you budget flexibility. We're gonna give you additional dollars for COVID. We, we, it's not the same message for childcare. The most important service to get families back into the workforce, none of those messages resonated. So, you know, I don't want to come down on the city staff because I know they're trying. And, but four months down the road, you might hear that you're getting extra money. But at the moment when you need those answers, they're usually not present. So our staff are weary. They're calling in sick. There's WSIB claims have increased. Um, their stress level has increased. People are taking off because they need to be home with their kids. The system needs a huge not just a band-aid, but it needs a revolution. We got to change. If childcare is important, um, just like healthcare is important, then we've got to invest and we need to have some program funding so that so it's predictable and that you can operate knowing that there is money to 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 operate the you know the, the services that are so critical for a community. So I hope this is a wake up call for our funders. You know, many of our funders, foundations and whatever are calling us and saying, we're just giving you money and you spend it where you need it best. We need that kind of approach <laughs> child care. Um, we need that approach for nonprofits going forward, but then that's another subject. 
but we need to know that we have a predictable formula. What the way childcare is set up, it's not set up to operate in this kind of environment. And, and I'm hoping that there will be major changes coming soon because um, parents um, and our staff, you know, we, we can't um, take anymore. I think the system is stretched from all ends and change must come and must come soon. If we want to get the economy back up and running, we know every dollar you spend in early years will return. The return on investment is about one to 17. And uh, it's about time that all levels of government, um, you know, really invest in these services and come up with a better way for us to, um, to, to operate. And it needs to happen now. No, I it, agree. It, the system cannot continue as the way it is. Okay. Oh, cool. Well, I'll you. end there because oh, I'm sure. sure there'll be lots of questions, but uh, it's it's under stress and it's got to stop. Okay. Thanks for getting us started. Um, speaking of parents, um, Kate, um, could you speak about your experience and the experience of your friends and colleagues who are trying to manage things? in this very disrupted time. Absolutely, so you know how difficult it is, of course, in, in Canada and in Toronto in particular to get a daycare spot. So we have, or we had two of our kids in daycare, a very hard one spot. We were on that list for a long time. And when everything closed last March, I think there was a sense amongst the parents of, okay, you know, we're regrouping. The government's going to come up with a plan we're going to be able to go back we don't know what's happening but it's okay we're all at home we're all safe everything's fine and then our center reopened in july and we decided to keep the kids home a little bit just again we weren't really sure what was going to happen when things reopened we kept them home till august and then sent them back and everything went pretty well all things considered you know really good um I, and now I'm, still, I'm thinking maybe they came up with a lot of these perhaps on their own, but a lot of good measures in place and processes, you know, to keep parents safe and to cohort the children. And, and we were really, really lucky until a few weeks ago. And we had a case in my child's class. And then as that was resolving, there was an outbreak in one of the other classrooms. And, you know, we've just been, how can we help? What can we do? completely understanding of, you know, with case counts so high in the community, it was kind of inevitable. We all, I think, kind of knew like it's going to come to us at some point. And I think we were just really lucky that we were able to get through so far of the pandemic without it. But, mm -hmm. you know, um, our kid has been home with us now since about a month. And I, I, you know, we have a group chat with the parents and we're all starting to get a little, <laughs> a little stirry at yeah. home. And, uh, you know, and, and so I really started to get concerned. I mean, I've been kind of low, you know, low level, like what's gonna happen? What's happening here? Didn't seem like there was a great plan in place for our schools, schools are closed. Uh, but we were kind of able to muddle through because there's virtual school. A two-year-old cannot do any sort of virtual school unless you just stick them in front of the TV all day. You know, there's not gonna be a teacher or anything watching them. So we were getting um, pretty anxious about this. And I started to look into all the vaccination prioritization that we were hearing about in the media thinking, well, clearly they're going to vac vaccinate educators, right? Like that must be number one on the list because my kid, child in, in kindergarten, if she goes ever goes back in person, she'll be eating, you know, kids eat constantly. <laughs> she'll be eating without a mask on. My two-year-old doesn't have a mask on unless he's going from room to room, the kids are supposed to wear masks in the hallways or in common crush areas where they could encounter the other cohorts. And I started to look into it and it really seemed like this was the forgotten group. And that these people who are spending so much of their time and energy caring for our children all day so we can go work, basically where, you know, especially childcare providers, you know, they know our kids since they're tiny, tiny, they, help, they basically spend more time with our kids than we do. Why are they not being protected? They're around unmasked, tiny children all day. You know what kids are like, even before a yes. pandemic, you know how easy it is for kids to spread germs. I mean, the fact that we got this far through is an absolute miracle. All of the kids in our class have been tested multiple, multiple times for, you know, runny noses and coughs and sneezes. And we've been just so grateful this whole time. And I realized, you know, this doesn't seem to be a high priority, unfortunately, right now. It doesn't seem to be that educators 
daycare workers, you know, people who are driving kids to school on school buses, they were not part of the original plan. And I just don't understand how that's possible because anyone who has a kid, anyone who knows a kid, anyone who knows people who have kids, they know that if we don't protect our children, we cannot protect families. And if we don't protect families, we can't protect our province. So it really seemed like a big oversight. And I'm so grateful that so many people were advocating to have those folks um, you know, pushed up, bumped up the, the priority list. And that we heard last Tuesday that that prioritization was gonna be open. But even then, you know, I was having a long call with our son's daycare teacher over the weekend because she was confused. She said, okay, so now I'm hearing I can get vaccinated, but where, what website, you know, there's a lot of information out there. And unless you're on it, unless you're on Twitter or you're talking to people or you're on like the mom's Facebook group that we have in our community, it can be hard to know where to go. So I think from my own perspective as a parent, I was really quite shocked that this, this group seemed to be forgotten. I'm glad that it sounds like they're, you know, and I'm sure there were loud voices out there advocating for them, which is why this is happening. Yeah. But it is really stunning that sort of at a, at a governmental policy level, people caring for young children who are unmasked all day wasn't like an immediate, oh, we must get these people vaccinated right away. So I'm glad that the government was able to reverse that. I'm hopeful, you know, if you count backwards from September, if we still keep that 112 days between doses, all, all teachers in Ontario will have already had to have had their first shot. That's not happened. So all teachers counting backwards from a start date of September 9th, which is I think what the TDSD is saying is August 19th. So all teachers have to be fully vaccinated by that day in order for kids to go back to schools, in order for community transmission from school age kids to daycare age kids to be reduced. So I'm really hoping sort of the next step will be, okay, we've opened up vaccination for everyone. Now we're gonna reduce that four month window for educators, daycare, you know, anyone who's working with kids so that hopefully we can all get back to school. Cause I'm like, please, so that our children <laughs> are home with us because I'm sure all working parents can, you know, whether you're working in the home or out of the home, it is a lot, it is a lot to, to have your kids home and they miss their friends. Yeah. You know, our son's been home with us and we are not as fun as other two-year-olds and we are definitely not as fun as his, as his childcare teachers. We are very boring compared to his daycare instructors for sure. <laughs> Kate, thank you very much for those comments. And before we go to Carolyn, I just want to remind people who are uh, taking part this evening that if you have questions or comments that you want to put, please type them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, when Carolyn has finished speaking, I'll be going to those comments and questions, putting questions to our panelists and relaying your comments uh, to the audience as a whole. And with that, Carolyn. The floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Peter, so much for hosting um, this event tonight. Um, it's really great to have a discussion about um, childcare right now. And thank you to both of the other panelists. Really good points um, that highlight the, the challenge that's uh, in front of us right now in, um, in childcare. And to go back to, um, you know, last year to the start of the pandemic when, when childcare was closed down, um, you know, temporarily, um, you know, lots of people in the, the child care sector, center directors, early childhood educators, you know, and parents, um, you know, came together and, and talked, there was, you know, this sort of groundswell of conversation around how do we reopen child care safely? How do we make sure that when child care reopens, it's done safely? And our organization and the Association of Early Child Educators Ontario did a survey um, to, to get ideas, to find out what was happening, what was working well in emergency childcare, um, and to, to put together a plan to take to the Ontario government to say, this is how you get from reopening to recovery, how you do it safely, how you maintain parents' confidence in the childcare system. We had 27 recommendations um, on how you could do that. And the Ford government basically ignored almost all of it. Um, they did open, I'd say the one thing they did was to open with a control of the cohort size, but they abandoned that by September. They went back to regular ratios. Um, and so what we saw was that then parents, um, as they became less comfortable with you know, what was happening and they weren't sure if this was safe anymore, 
started to pull their children out if they could right if they if they worked at home if they could make it work if they could you know um, and that of course requires a lot of privilege and other parents couldn't right um and so i feel like th at that point um the provincial government um you know was already failing to support the child care sector adequately um and and you know that went on for some time and through all of that I have to say the childcare workforce, early childhood educators and childcare workers have done an amazing job of trying to do the impossible, of trying to pivot and change and bring in new, um, you, know, uh, you know, regulations and safety procedures. Um, and it's taken a toll on them. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, we're, we're, I was just reading through a survey we've done at the workforce um, that plates a really bleak picture of the, the stress um, that they're under where they see themselves more now as being cleaners than as having any professional role or being able to really carry out their professional role as early child educators working with children. And instead they feel like they've been relegated to sort of just you know disinfecting surfaces all day. Um, and why is that? That's because we have a provincial government that has chosen to reopen childcare, not fund it adequately. Um, as you were saying, create not, not you know, give it the funding it needs to be able to operate um, and, uh, and just expect more and more of the predominantly women, many racialized women who work in the sector. Um, and so when we came to vaccination, um, you know, was I surprised to see that they'd forgotten childcare? Not really, because this is a minister who's routinely forgotten childcare. The Minister of Education seems to forget that childcare is in his portfolio on a regular basis. Um, so we had been working when they first saw the rollout document for, for vaccination to make sure that early childhood educators and childcare workers and home childcare providers were there the same line where it said teachers and education workers, because it's the same level of risk. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it was until it came to actually be um, put, into, put into practice. And then the Minister of Education got up and said, made an announcement and said, schools are gonna be closing and teachers are gonna be getting vaccinated in these hotspot postal codes and childcare will remain open and crickets the childcare workers would be vaccinated. And so, you know, huge uh, outcry from the sector, um, you know, and, and advocates like, your, like yourself, Peter, with petitions. And we had an open letter that had 12,000 signatures from, from people and individual um, folks writing in and going to their local public health units and making deputations um, and all of that just to win vaccine priority um, for, for child care workers in the licensed sector, um, home child care providers, um, you know, that aren't, that aren't licensed, um, you know, they still don't have anything. They, you know, they, they don't have it. They can't have an employment letter. Um, and so they're still uh, left out of that. Um, and this is a situation where we should not be considering, you know, um, you know, who your employer is. It should be, what is your level of risk? What is your level of risk? Um, and the risk for people working in a group care setting with young children who cannot mask is great. Um, so it's been a really <laughs> tough challenge. And I feel like it's a government or provincial government um, that doesn't respect the work of early childhood educators, that doesn't respect the work of the child care sector. Um, but the good news is that other people have been listening and that, you know, a huge, um, you know, I'd say a huge groundswell more and more supporters um, as the pandemic has gone on have seen how important childcare is and how essential it's going to be to our recovery and how important it is to put it at the core of our recovery. So the federal government now has listened to that call and pledged $30 billion in the federal budget um, to childcare. Um, but the big battle now is going to be the negotiation between the province of Ontario and the federal government to ensure that that money is used well to support um, licensed child care programs to support early child educators and to make sure that that money goes to rebuilding, um, recovering and, uh, you know, and, and having a, a, a safe 
um, you know, uh, recovery for everybody um, and to really building our childcare system and making it the core to our social and economic recovery. So thanks, I can see there's lots of questions and I'm happy to, to, to chat and discuss. Okay. Carolyn, thanks very much for that. It was very, very helpful. Uh, I want to remind everyone who's out there that if you have a question that you want to pose to the panel or a comment that you want to make, please use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and I will be taking those. I have staff with us this evening who are going through the questions and comments, and I'll be posing them to the panelists. Uh, and I'm going to start off here. Um, I want, well, a question from Anonymous. And Anonymous, thank you for this question. Now that ECEs are finally eligible to get vaccinated, thank God, will parents be notified when the staff get vaccinated, similar to how we need to show proof of vaccination when we send our children to daycare? It seems to be a matter of privacy and some daycare owners are reluctant to provide this information. But I feel parents should be able to know whether or not their children's teachers are vaccinated since they're in very close contact daily. And I'm not sure who's best uh, set up to answer that, but I'll, I think I'll start with you, Carolyn, and I think Akua, you may well have commentary on it as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't say that I can offer a, you know, a full um, response to that because it's a situation that's, that's changing. Obviously vaccination is, is new. Um, you know, we know that vaccination is voluntary for any adult. Um, centers, as I understand it, are currently kind of developing vaccination policies. Um, so that's something that's kind of, I would say, underway at the moment. Um, but the, the person who asked is absolutely right to, you know, to cite that there's, there are going to be issues there between, um, you know, privacy and, you know, your, um, and, and the health and safety reasons, et cetera. So um, that's a good question. And I'd say that it's something that's still kind of being developed. Yeah. Thank you. Raku, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, I just want to say it's kind of a legal question because the vac you know, an individual getting vaccination is really up to them to share that information with us. Um, one of the things we're doing is at least if you know, we're giving out attestation forms for people to sign if they haven't been vaccinated to just make sure they have the information. But it's a legal question. And as Carolyn said, we're working on policies because we're gonna have to get some legal advice on, on you know, how we can still get the information that we need to operate while we're main, you know, respecting the privacy of our employees. So it's it's something where we're, I don't think we have a clear answer yet and, and it's a legal one for us. Yeah. Okay, thanks Akua. I'm gonna read out a comment and then I'll go to another question. Comment from Amy, as a director of a nonprofit community-based childcare center, I can attest that the sector is just completely exhausted and tired of the disrespect from this government. We're constantly ignored, not consulted, with no engagement from this government. It is not okay. Akua, I can see that she speaks for many of you who are running centers. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yes, just to, the, you know, I think I tried to talk about that in my presentation is just a poor communication. There was or no communication. Um, and it's hard for you to run an organization or run a program you know, when you don't have the, the, the right information and it's really disrespectful and it's, but it, it's more than disrespectful. It's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a high risk for us. It's a risk issue. And, uh, and as Carolyn is saying, you know, governments, you know, they, they have to do better and they, you know, they can't continue to, to forget about us and, and the important role that we serve um, in this economy. Okay. And if I can just add, I know that um, you know what's really happening is that is that this disrespect and the burnout and stress that we're hearing from the childcare um, workforce is going to destabilize programs. We already yeah. we came into the pandemic or through a recruitment and retention crisis in childcare, and that's only gotten worse um, as you know, and, and it's going to get it's going to continue to get worse until we have a real workforce strategy for early childhood education and care that respects the work of early childhood educators and childcare workers, that guarantees them decent work and pay. Um, and I think that until that changes, you know, we're, we're going to continue to see this, um, you know, retention crisis get worse. Thank you for that. I have a question from Lauren. What can we do to lend our voice to the effort to get teachers and childcare workers prioritized 
for full vaccination before the next school year? Exactly the Kate question that you raised, Kate. Um, Carolyn, you organize politically for childcare. What's your advice? Yeah, um, I would say that, you know, it's just, you know, making making your voice heard, write to your MPP, write to the minister, um, you know, look around, there are, uh, you know, often open letters and uh, and petitions that you can sign as well um, and, and share them with friends. I'd say that, um, you know, the more the voices, the, the better. If you're um, in touch with people, as Kate said, you know, having those calls of, you know, if your childcare center is closed and you're, you know, doing those everyday preschool calls, I, I did those a couple of times. It was like every day at 11, get all the preschoolers together. Um, talk to the other parents about doing the same thing. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, a really increasing number of voices saying that this is important, that we need to prioritize um, full vaccination for teachers, education workers, um, childcare workers, uh, and, and childcare providers. Okay. I would Thank argue you. as well that social media is a very powerful tool. There was an article this week in the Toronto Star essentially discussing the fact that the Minister of Education's employees were perusing teachers' Twitter feeds back last fall not so much to act on the concerns of educators, but to note them, I guess, for the future. <laughs> so we know that that particular ministry is very in tune with uh, social media. There was also a huge outcry when March break was moved on Instagram. A lot of students were getting quite vocal. So this, you know, it's a changing world. Um, there's a lot of pressure on social media. So if you can speak out on Twitter, Facebook in your local parenting groups, anything like that, um, in addition to sort of tuning into your MPPs, uh, that's absolutely a way. And just talking to people, like when I've been speaking to parents in my neighborhood, I honestly feel like everyone is dealing with so many different issues during the pandemic that it kind of, you, you lose sight of all the things that are happening because you really have to focus on what you can do for yourself and for your family. So also just having an honest conversation with people, like, did you know that there is no plan currently to vaccinate all educators in Ontario by Labor Day? Like, there is no plan. What does that mean for schools reopening? Do you want your kid to be home on the computer again for a third year in a row? People may just not know because there's so much changing all the time that it's hard to keep up. So just having open and honest conversations, you know, at a distance mask <laughs> with people in your neighborhood can also be really helpful too, I find. I agree. I'm gonna go on to another comment and then question comment from Ashley. Just a comment, childcare educators are heroes. Your commitment to their job and to helping to raise our kids through the pandemic and all these unknowns is incredible. Thank you to you all. We agree. Absolutely we agree. agree. Absolutely. <laughs> So a uh, question from Betsy, given the science is clear that COVID is airborne, has there been any funding or information provided on improving ventilation and daycare centers? Akua, Carolyn, can you, I, I can see you're shaking your head Akua, so that may indicate a no. Yeah, you know, this is just an extension of what I said earlier, you know, the communication between the funders and the sector is pretty poor or non-existent or <laughs> inadequate. And so we're barely getting enough money to, you know, to have regular cleaners to help us, you know, um, clean the high touch point areas or to get PPEs, never mind ventilators. It's the simple core things that we need um, are not there. So nobody's talking about ventilators at this time. How we can, can use ventilation in, 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 uh, in, in these centers. It's not even on the table as I, from a funder. If I can Please. just give a, a, an example, I, I think that this issue actually, it's it's something that shows us um, how differently childcare is treated than education in school. Um, we have more than half of um, Ontario's childcare centers are in schools, um, but they're treated as just like as as renters, as the, the, they're in that space. And there was funding from the federal government went through the Ministry of Education to put HVAC systems and ventilation into schools. Now, of course, there wasn't enough of it and it didn't get as far as it needed to, but, um, but this is how it looks for childcare. There's a school, HVAC systems and, and 
filtration systems are being put in, are being installed in the school, um, there are three childcare rooms. The childcare center is told, would you like one of these? Because if you would, you'll have to pay for it yourself. Um, even though this is publicly funded and it's for the health and safety of all the children, right? And there seems to be regularly uh, uh, forgetting that these children are the same, they're the same children, the same families, whether they're in childcare, whether in schools. Um, and it just is a sign to me of how broken things are that we see this so separately, that childcare is still treated as this market commodity and it's parents have to pay through the nose for it. Um, centers you know, are having to uh, sort of un really underpay early child educators for their work because if they paid them decently, parent fees would go up. And why is that? It's because the entire system is underfunded yes. um, by the government. So it's just a, a little sign to me, but it, it just spoke so much when I saw this email from someone saying, oh, we were told if we want to have air filtration, you know, we're just going to have to find it out of our budget ourselves. Yikes. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. It's from Lauren. Any insight, and this is, follows on your comments, Carolyn, but Kate and Akua, you may well have comments as well. Any insight into why childcare was so blatantly ignored? It would seem like such an obvious place to invest to ensure folks can return to work full force. <laughs> That's a, it's a great question. It's like it's like the question. Um, you know, why is it so routinely ignored? Um, and I would say that I mean one of the reasons is just the here in Ontario, this is the current government or government. Um, they are ideologically opposed to really funding childcare well, and they will only do it if they are forced to by, by real pressure from the public. Um, you know, their preferred, you know, when, when they got into power, their preferred action on childcare was the, was a tax credit. That's what they see as being, um, adequate and it's not adequate. It doesn't fund the services. Um, but there's been a sea change and more people are seeing that to, to make a change in childcare, you need to fund the services. So I think that if we want to see that change, huge public pressure onto the Ford Conservatives, because we know that they do move um, with uh, pressure from the public. I think it also speaks to, there's a comment from Lisa saying that, you know, early learning and care is more than just the need for the workforce. These are, these are people who have gone to school and have been trained on effective means to care for and encourage the development of our children. Mm -hmm. You see it simply as a place to park little people so that their parents can go work and make money and contribute to the economy, then you probably don't really care to fund it that much. Mm -hmm. If you see it as a place where small children's brains can develop and their social interactions can blossom and they're being cared for by trained educators, then you would invest in the system. And so I really think it's also a female driven, you know, system. Like we're seeing the comments here about burnout in my own research. I look at folks working in long-term care sector. It's very similar, underpaid, underfunded, undervalued, female work, racialized workforce. These are very, very similar. It's very different <laughs> um, ends of the age spectrum, but the way that people are treated in that workforce seems to be quite similar. And it's a female driven workforce, so you can take from that what you will. But I absolutely think if you really strongly believe that this isn't just a place that your kid can go to so you can sit at the computer or go out to your job, but it's a place to, to help your children reach their full potential, then hopefully that is something that we can share with the government and encourage them to properly fund the system to reflect that. And I think if you have a government that believes in the value of equality and a woman's right to be into the workforce, um, if you value that, then we would do all that we can to make sure that that woman is supported while she's in the workforce. No, I, these are all really insightful comments. I, I'll just jump in. I'm not a panelist, but I'm sure you'll be forgiving um, because I sit in the legislature opposite this government on a regular basis. It really is like dealing with uh, a bunch of frat boys. I mean, I, it's quite shocking to me. Um, that's what their culture is. And boy, you're right, thinking about looking after elderly women 
in long-term care or looking after children in childcare, not part of their mental universe. Just, it is not. Uh, just, you're right about the ideology, you're right about all the other analysis, but just culturally, this is who they are. Mm -hmm. And they do respond to a huge amount of political pressure, no doubt about it. And they can read public opinion polls and women reject this government by a very large measure. And they will only have the smallest chance of being able to talk to women if they actually take this issue seriously. And I think they need to have that further impressed on them. I'm gonna read a comment from Lynn. It's stunning that ECEs were first to be expected to provide care for parents who needed to work away from home at great personal risk, yet near the last to be given vaccines. The government should be held accountable for closure in centers now. And um, another one, this is a, a fairly long question. I'll read it out though, because I think it's consequential. Our child care center is licensed for 62 children. In order to open safely that for our families to feel safe, we've had to hire two extra full-time staff and have been rapid testing our 14 staff every Monday. That alone costs us $650 out of pocket every week. We also did not get our PPE, masks and visors, March, April, or May, so we have to buy our own. Is there any funding available to reimburse this kind of expense? We have no idea who to even ask. We've asked Toronto Children's Services and our program advisor, and no one has an answer. So there's a practical question there, but also illustrative, a coup of what you've been saying, well, actually all three of you, I have to say, of a, a failure to provide the resources necessary for the centers to work properly. Mm -hmm. And with that said, Carolyn or Akua, can either of you comment on where people can apply for reimbursement on this kind of expense? Is there a place to apply? Well, do you want to go, Akua? I'm just thinking it should it should be, there is a safe, safe start fun, um, yeah. funding that they've provided um for the sector to address some of our COVID needs um so I would really pressure the city <laughs> to um to use your state your safe start funds that is coming periodically we're not sure how often they're coming we're not sure if they're going to be here you know for how long but uh whatever funding you're getting for that I think there was an email that came out today about safe staff funding so yeah you should be able to get that from the city. I, I mean, I, I know we, we have been lucky because we're multi-service and we're getting our PPEs from, um, from MCCSS or MOH, but it's, it's, it's a big issue with uh, the, 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 city, the child care that they never made funding available, especially as we were getting ready to open mm -hmm. to have those things. <laughs> And and I can just add that I know. Go ahead. Go ahead. I heard from I've heard I heard from many childcare centers in the last couple of months that they had been receiving and they should have been receiving and, and you're right it's it's funded through the safe restart money um, shipments of uh, PPE regularly um, but we heard about delays many centers from many centers delays in that and then of course having to go and purchase their own as as the person who asked the question said um, so yeah I would say. Um, the city is probably going to the province and saying we have an issue. We need to be able to reimburse people, um, but definitely make the, it. Sounds like you've made the city um, staff aware of it, which is the thing to do. And then um, you know, and then now that we know that this is an issue, we'll be taking it up with the Ministry of Education because if you're having this problem, then I can guarantee you hundreds of other childcare centers are having the same problem. Okay, thank you. I have a question here from Robbie. I appreciate all that is being said and can only imagine how hard it is for the childcare workers. I feel the despair and struggle in your voices. As a parent, I would like to know what in your opinion is the path forward? What needs to happen? What do we as parents do if the things that you're suggesting don't happen? And Carolyn, I'll start with you because you do more political organizing, but I think Akua and Kate uh, I think your insights would be useful here. Carolyn? Thanks. So first of all, thank you so much for that um, question and an offer of support um, because parent voices are, are just so valuable in this um, struggle. Uh, early childhood educators, I know I, I um, you know, work with a lot and we uh, are, are people who are in the sector for a long time. And what we find is that 
childcare parents, right? They're they're in there for a short time, and we also we are constantly needing to find new parent champions for childcare um, because you know once they hit the school system and they're out of it, some of them stay in the childcare struggle, but some of them move on to other issues, of course, right? Um, so if you are a childcare parent now or you care about childcare, um, please, yes, your voice is so valuable to us. Um, so there's, uh, if you go to the Ontario Coalition, which is childcareontario.org, um, we're putting together a parent network, um, Ontario childcare parents. And I know I can see that actually one of the people on, because I'm looking on the participant list, um, there's someone called Wendy LaRose, and she is um, also working on organizing parents, a group called Toronto Parents for Childcare. Um, so if you can look up both of those on social media or, or get in touch with us, um, that would help. And then, you know, as I said before, just getting in touch, making sure you're sharing um, your concerns with uh, your MPP. Peter, of course, was always willing to listen, but also with the minister uh, and the premier, um, because they, they do look at, as, as Kate said, social media, and they do read um, emails that are coming into them. And if they know that parents are concerned, it, it means a lot. Thank you. Akua, Kate, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, I think we we need to rethink the funding formula for childcare. Yeah. Stop nickel and diming us and give us program funding. We need universal childcare that should be accessible for all families that need it, you know, whether it's the $10 a day or $11 a day, but we need universal childcare that's funded adequately. Um, and uh, so you don't have to be tinkering with your scheduling and your staffing and, and having the ability to pay the childcare workers what they're worth. Um, it, it, you know, Carolyn mentioned this, a lot of people are leaving the sector. I just had a conversation with a, with a, a director of a childcare for a large childcare in your writing, Peter, who's leaving and she's excellent, but she's, she's burnt out, she's tired. We need to pay our folks properly. We need program funding and we need to make it affordable for people, all families that need it. Okay. Kate, did you want to speak to this as well? I was just going to say, you know, I saw there's a comment here that says, you know, unfortunately we're too busy caring for children to advocate for ourselves and for to make the government pay attention to us. So I would say, you know, if you're a parent on this call or if your child has grandparents who have time available to them, Maybe if you, you know, if you do have the time, even if it's just a few minutes a day to send, like I like to call Doug Ford's office in the morning and just leave a message. His receptionists are always extremely nice. They take really good messages. But you know, public pressure, I think, is really the only thing that's left to us. We have an election coming up next June. Until then, this is this is the, the group in power. And so what we just have to do is between now and then, we have to be really, really clear that this is unacceptable, that the way that children and seniors in our communities have been treated is disgusting. It cannot ever, this cannot happen again. You know, um, we're, we're lucky that, you know, so many, it, it seems that COVID, if it does happen, it seems like it doesn't necessarily hit kids as hard as it does older adults. I think that's been a saving grace of this, but, you know, kids are getting it, kids are passing it to their families. <laughs> People, you know, are passing it around, you know, to other members of their family. Like we have to be really, really careful and we have to make sure that we're vaccinating the people who are taking care of our children. I see some comments in the chat as well about like, well, why are we prioritizing teachers and who many of whom are working from home now? And I think it goes back to, you know, the comments of my fellow panelists that again, childcare workers are always sort of bottom of the barrel because they're, they're sort of seen, you know, they're, they're not seen necessarily in the same way that, that, um, you know, primary and secondary teachers are. So I think just keep advocating, keep putting pressure. If you have the time, family, friends have time, call the government, write letters, email. I mean, that's all I'm doing right now. I don't know if there's anything better. I'm doing any petition that comes, I sign it and I send it on to my friends. I mean, at least it feels like you're doing something and that your voice is being heard in a small way. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just going to add another question in here and it follows on your comment, Kate, and the comments both you and Aku have made, Carolyn, uh, from Anonymous, Ray Organizing, does it really work to send letters to MPPs and the education minister? <laughs> I've been in this a long time and I've never seen this work. Isn't there something else we could try? Mm. That's a great, uh, that's a, a great question. Um, and I can say that it, it often feels like it doesn't work. 
um, because you know you send an email and what you get is an automatic reply um, and you know you feel like well did anybody actually even read that um, and it can certainly feel that way but what I know is that when a large number of people <laughs> send letters personal letters um, it can make a difference ministers staff MPP staff, they track the number of communications they get on certain topics. And when they see a spike in that, and when they see a lot of people um, reaching out with concerns on a certain topic, it makes a difference. I always think that like, you know, signing a petition, that's good. If you've got more time, you know, write your own message. If you've got more time, make a phone call make a phone call or and set up a meeting. You can still have virtual meetings with MPPs on issues. Um, just get in their face about it however you can. And I would say, I know as we're talking about this, like what can we do now? What's going to make a difference? I would say the most important thing, even with everything that's happening right now and how it can feel like everything is on fire, the thing that's gonna make the biggest difference for childcare is the federal government's commitment to $30 billion to childcare. And what we need is for the province of Ontario to agree and to, to agree to work collaboratively with the federal government on childcare. Um, because what we've seen is that conservative provinces like Alberta have already said they're gonna make you know, a big song and dance about this. They want to have, be able to use the money for whatever they want. We need Ontario has not yet said what they are gonna do. So that means it's still in play. And that means that if a large number of people tell the Minister of Education and Premier Ford that they need to cooperate, they could move on this, which is good. And they have every reason to because it's not money that they have to spend. All they have to do is say yes. They have to say yes to receiving funding that would double the childcare budget or more. Right? And they have to agree to spend it on licensed childcare to improve quality, to improve pay for educators and to make childcare more affordable for children and, and their families. So it's a simple thing for them to do. They just have to say yes. Carolyn, thanks very much for that. Uh, I'll just note as well, folks, that it in fact were, it in fact, in the last few weeks, it was the tactics of public statements, heavy phone calling, uh, heavy lobbying of MPPs that changed the priority for childcare workers in the vaccine lineup. And so it is possible to apply pressure. Uh, it is very frustrating to deal with a blank wall, uh, but frankly, if you batter that blank wall hard enough, things do fall off of it. And in this case, we're able to win that prioritization for childcare workers. I've got one last comment I'd like to read out and then we need to wrap up. Uh, from Eva, I am the child care director for the neighborhood group and have 10 sites employing over 120 staff. Staff have been working extra hard to provide quality care under such stressful measures. I just want to thank the panel for speaking and advocating for all the early childhood educators. Everything that was communicated today was spot on and gives us a deeper insight on how essential and important we are. Hopefully we can get fully vaccinated soon so we can create a safer environment for our children, staff and families. Well, I certainly couldn't have put it any better. Um, we're in our last five minutes. If the panelists don't mind, if we could have some wrap up comments from the three of you and I'll go in uh, reverse order. Um, Carolyn, you were the last to speak at the beginning. If you could wrap up here. Sure, I was just thinking about um, Ava's comment and it is like the work of early child educators in this has been enormous and um, so important. And I always feel as I mean, as a parent myself, you know, I see I, I sent my son back to childcare last year, not because I was feeling stressed that I couldn't get work done, although that was certainly there. But it was because he was unhappy. He wanted to see his friends, he wanted to see his educators, it made him have a have a better life to be able to be in childcare um, and, and with his social group. Um, and when I saw how his early child educators made him so happy, were coming up with great ideas, thinking about how to be creative with the, you know, with all of the health and safety rules, what they could still do. 
And then when I read comments in the surveys that we send out to ECEs saying how stressed they are, how they're at a breaking point. And I just know that every morning they get up, they're stressed, they're, um, you know, they're exhausted. And then they put on a happy face and they give children a wonderful day. And I just think that we owe them so much more. And if anybody on the call can, can raise your voice, you know, tell this government they have to respect and protect early childhood educators and childcare workers, and they have to make a change for childcare. Because when you support childcare workers, you support children and families. That's how you do it, because they're the key to quality childcare. Thanks. Thank you. Kate, if we could have your wrap up comment. Well, I'm really, I mean, I'm very new to this space. So people's comments on here, like what more can we do? That's where I was. This is, this is, I think how Peter, how you found me is just, I've been yes. so frustrated <laughs> because, <You're right>. I, <laughs> hello, because I just feel like working parents in particular have really been abandoned and we, our children are at home. They're staring at a screen. We're trying to get our work done and, and manage, you know, work like our children's development and it's it's not possible and there's a reason why you don't work from home typically when you have children underfoot and why there there are educators in daycares because you know as carolyn said like my son also he's at daycare and he loves it and he loves being with his friends and they send us pictures and the things they're doing i would never come up with any of this stuff they're so creative mm -hmm. they're so innovative everything is distanced and everything is washed and you know i'm seeing the comments in the chat like you may feel that your job has been relegated to cleaning and and you know PPE and but really honestly parents we know what you're doing and we are so appreciative and we miss you when our classes are closed and our kids miss you one of the ways that I can get my son to do things is I invoke the name of one of his teachers and then he'll know <laughs> what to do <laughs> so thank you you know thank you to everyone thank you to my you know my fellow panelists here thank you to Peter for having me but honestly if you feel frustrated and you think that I'm not doing enough, just raise your voice, even a little bit, even if you can just a little bit. And I, I promise it, it will make a difference. And like Peter said, you know, there was so much public pressure on the government. They quickly reversed and said, okay, we'll, we'll move up vaccination. I strongly believe that if we put a lot of pressure on this government, they will reverse course and they will ensure that childhood educators and education workers going into schools in September will be prioritized for the second dose of vaccine because more and more vaccines are arriving. There's going to be a lot and they're going to have to decide who gets all of this glut of vaccines. So we need to put public pressure to say childcare workers and you know who are every day around the unmasked kids and then education workers for the fall. So I think that's sort of the next the next area at least of my own <laughs> my own mm -hmm. telephone calls. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for having me. It's just been a delight to be here. Well, it's been great. Akua, you got the last word. Right. I, I, I just want to say as operators, we've really worked hard over the last few, the last year to really take care of our important child care workers. You know, when, when the emergency order came about, we didn't terminate or lay off our staff. We kept them. I've never seen so much fear in the eyes of our employees before. And uh, we, we decided as an organization, we would not lay them off. This is not their fault. And we use this opportunity to do a lot of training and education. So I know all the operators that are out there and there are several on this call that we're, you know, we're continuing to, to try and take care of um, the workers because they're important. And even though they are fearful, and exhausted, they're coming in every day and are trying to do right by all the families that they serve. So I just hope we can um, get the support that the directors or the operators of child cares can get the support that we need to take care of uh, the important um, workers that are providing this invaluable service to the community. And, and like all the, the rest of my panelists, um, I, I just hope that we could all do that we can write letters to your MPPs and call and do all you need because the sector is, uh, is, um, has been overlooked. And if there's anything that we know that the pandemic has showed us is that there's a lot of vulnerability in the childcare system and it needs fixing and it can't wait because this is not gonna be the only pandemic that we're gonna have. No, thank you. Um, 
I have a few things to say on my own to wrap up. First of all, I want to thank you three panelists. You were wonderful. You were exactly what I wanted, and I think exactly what the participants wanted as well. Really uh, insightful comments, really empathetic. It, you've been great. Uh, all of you who participated this evening, who asked questions, made comments, thank you so much. Uh, it makes a real difference when we have these kinds of events to have your direct input. Uh, to my staff, to Rob and Elaine and Louise, who did all the work in the background, it would be impossible to do this stuff without you. So my great thanks to you as well. And I want to say to those of you who may well be interested, I'm having a panel next week on elementary and uh, secondary education and the issues that are arising there. Uh, a lot is coming up. A lot came up today with the uh, education minister's comments about expanding remote learning uh, going mm -hmm. forward. And I have to say, many parents have told me that is not their favorite way of having their children's interact, children interact with the education system. So I'll be sending out notice on that. Thank you, everyone. It's been a really productive night, and I look forward to getting together again soon. Take care. <laughs>